Good morning, and welcome to the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. I am Pastor Richard T. Wade, and I would like to say thank you for joining us today. I pray the Word of God can speak to you, and the Holy Spirit make it real to you. Now, a pre-recorded message from Cornerstone Assemblies of God. Amen. Praise God. Glory. Psalms 100. A heart of thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I'm just going to do some expository preaching from this passage for a moment and then we'll carry on. But make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth. Didn't say that you have to be the best speaker. It doesn't say that you have to have the best singing voice. It doesn't say that everybody has to like it. It says a noise. I looked up in the original Hebrew, and it most literally would be translated racket. (laughs) A racket. Make a joyful racket. Make a joyful noise. It doesn't even have to be in unison. Just make a joyful sound unto the Lord all the earth and so if your sound is a shout if your sound is silent but just raising a hand if your sound is out of tune if it's a little flat or a little sharp it is all beautiful unto the Lord if it is bathed in joy joy make a joyful noise unto the Lord it's a word that We in America, in our democracy mindset, we don't quite understand what a Lord is. We kind of treat Jesus as a politician, you know. We'll vote him in and we'll vote him out. And if he doesn't have popular opinion, we just don't let him serve. But no, he's Lord and King. He don't care what your vote is, you still belong to him. (laughs) Pay your taxes or don't, the dirt you stand on is still his. (laughs) Worship him or not, the breath in your lungs still belong to him. He is Lord and King of all. And so if we could get an understanding that uh, he's the boss. You realize that he's the boss even if you aren't a Christian. He's still the boss. He holds the deed to your soul. So you can either worship him as Lord and reap the benefits therein, or you cannot worship him as Lord and still reap the benefits therein. Whether you said benefits, well, it's a benefit. It's just not a benefit I like. Huh? So you can have a benefit of joy and peace and a present help and eternal life, or you can reap the benefit of eternal damnation and separation from God in an eternal hell. Choice is yours. He's the boss either way. Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful shout. A joyful sound unto the Lord, all the earth. Serve. Well, (laughs) let's stop. Let's talk about that word. Serve. Serve means somebody else is benefiting, not me. Service looks all different directions. It can be in a multitude of ways. I'm not even going to give examples this morning. But serve. Serve means I'm not the beneficiary. Serve means I'm going to turn my attention to someone else. And I'm going to serve the Lord with gladness. So to serve the Lord with gladness means let me take my focus off of me and put it on him and be happy about it. Let me put him before me and be happy about it. And when I put him before me and I'm happy about it, he will instruct me from time to time to put others before me. And be happy about it. No, I'm, I'm just telling you it's a heart of thanksgiving. Because I'm so thankful for what I already have. Who cares if I get anything else? So therefore, Lord, I'm going to serve you 
and I'm going to be glad about it. To come before his presence with singing. Here we go with singing again. And we were going to make a joyful noise or a joyful song unto the Lord. Look, your soul should be singing. Doesn't matter if you got a good voice or not. If you've got a heart of thanksgiving, your soul will sing. I was driving the other day. Uh, I think it was the night of the glow run. It was Allie and I in the vehicle. And just out of nowhere, the song, uh, Let It Rain, just bubbled up inside of me. And I just started singing it out loud. And she looked at me kind of funny. And I'm like, I'm probably thinking, whoo, <laughs> off key, you know. But uh, she looked, I said, what? I said, I don't know where that come from. It just bubbled out. And she says, no, we're singing that tomorrow, talking about last Sunday. And then we did, you know. And I... I think she may send me the song list, but being honest with you, I'm, I don't look at them. I'm, one of the, I'm the worst member of the worship team. I get up here and I say, what's the first song this week that I'm playing? I don't know until I get here Sunday morning. Cooper and I went hunting this weekend, and all weekend long, we drove to Foreman. We went out to eat. We was walking out to the stand, me and him both, just singing, where do I go? All week long, we've been singing, I go to the rock of my, just, I'll, me, he'll start it and I'll finish it. I'll start it, he'll finish it. We just chime in and be off key together, <laughs> making a joyful noise unto the Lord. I get here this morning, I say, what's the first song we're playing? I go to the rock of well, I don't even need to practice that. I've been singing it for three days. You know what I mean? It's like, the Lord Huh? Your soul will sing. And it might not even be a written song. It might just be a thank you, God, you are faithful. God, you are good. It might be in your prayer language. You might sing in the Spirit. But a heart of thanksgiving will produce a soul that sings unto the Lord. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. He's not just the boss, but He is creator. Everything that is, everything that was, and everything that shall be is the result of Him saying so. He is God. Know that the Lord, He is God. We try to put ourselves as God. We try to put our jobs as God. We try to put our hobbies as God. And we need to remember that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, not we ourselves. We, you know, here in America, and I don't mean to beat upon America, but it is, this is just our nature. You know, I'm a self-made man. You know, we got self-made millionaires. You know, pull our own selves up by the bootstrap. And the word of the Lord reminds us, you ain't nothing. I am the Lord and I am God. Everything that is is because I said so. You ain't made nothing. <laughs> uh -huh. So, you know, if you're a self-made millionaire... You better get a heart of thanksgiving and thank the Lord for it. If you've been given talents and ability that has farewelled in your life, glory to God. You better praise him for it because he's the one who gave it and he's the one who can take it away. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people. I love this psalm, how it just points out that you, it's all his, or a bit of it. We are his people, and we're the sheep of his pastor. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I'm going to talk more about thanksgiving in just a second. We enter into his courts with a praise and be thankful to him. And bless his name. We have command from the word of the Lord 
to be thankful. Well, you just don't know what I'm going through. Are you saved? You've got reason to be thankful. Are you sucking air today? You've got reason to be thankful because I believe that is the grace and mercy of God. You're getting another day to make sure that you're ready to meet him. You're getting another day to be obedient and be found a good and faithful servant. I might not have been a good faithful servant yesterday, but in his grace and his mercy, he's given me another day to make it right. We got reason to thank him. I can't talk about thanksgiving and needing to praise the Lord and needing his presence without my mind going to Melinda McMillan over at Word of Grace Church in Hope. I know I've told you this story before. I'm going to tell it to you again because it's just a good story because it's the truth. But I was at the church one Tuesday. I was editing sermons and working. And at this time, uh, Melinda was working just where she drove past the church and she saw my vehicle and she pulled in and she came in and she was just upset, and rightfully so. Uh, her husband wasn't doing well at the time, uh, not sick-wise, but just he wasn't acting right. Her kids weren't doing right, wasn't acting right. Money was tight. <laughs> you know, car was messing up. All four tires were bald. It was just if it could go wrong, it has gone wrong. And she just walked in just defeated. And she says, I just need some prayer. I'm just defeated. And we talked, and I won't get it, but I, I remember this portion just vividly. I said, Melinda, you've got to start thanking God for what you do have. And she just kind of looked at me. She says, I know, but I don't even know what I do have. I said, you got shoes on your feet? Yeah. Thank him. I said, thank, like, like right now. I said, thank you, Lord, for my shoes. You got socks on in them shoes? Yeah, and that's what we did. We just started from her toes and just went up. And so she thanked him for her shoes and her socks and her pants and her shirt. I, she, she said, my car ain't doing quiet. I said, does it start? Yeah, thank him for it. Is it getting you from point A to point B? Yeah, you thank him for it. Better than walking. I'd rather put along at 45 than have to walk. Huh? Thank him for it. Do you got food on your table? Yeah, thank him for it. You got a roof over your head? Yes, thank him for it. And it didn't take three or four minutes of her thanking the Lord for what she did have. And the Spirit of God hit her and joy filled her up. And she took out running around that sanctuary, shouting and praising God in the Spirit. Did her kids change in that moment? Nope. Did her husband change in that moment? Nope. Did her bank account magically fill up? Nope. Did her car just start working perfectly right? Nope. But she began to thank him that turned into a praise that entered into his presence that found his joy that allowed his peace that began to form a victory. It all began with a heart of thanksgiving. And so this morning, I want to encourage you that there is a way to the presence of the Lord. There is a way to victorious living, and it begins with a heart of thankfulness unto him. Verse 5 goes on to say, for the Lord is good. <laughs> I feel like the whole Bible can be summed up in those one phrase. But why should it? Because the Lord is good. But what? But he's good. He's good. The righteous have not been forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is an ever-present help. It's who he is. Well, he had not felt too close to me. Well, he might not have felt that way, but where have you been? Where have you been? If you call on him with the heart of repentance, he'll meet you there. And he'll pick you up out of that pit. But now if you want to set up residence in the pit and want the presence of God, I'm sorry, you're looking for something that don't exist. I'll say that again. If you want to set up residence in your pit and look for the presence of God, you are looking for something that does not exist. He'll meet you in your pit. 
And he'll take you out of your pit. And he'll change the course of your destiny in just a mention of his name. Because he's a good God. I'm running out of time. I hadn't even made it to point one. I'm still in my introduction. I have a feeling that tonight will be a heart of thanksgiving part two. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, he's good. He's great and he's greatly to be praised. And his mercy is everlasting. Glory to his name. Oh, and his truth, it endures. That's, that's enough. That's another one that's enough. The Lord is good and his truth endures. So when I feel like giving up, when I feel like giving in, his truth carries on. When I mess up, when I fall short, his truth carries on. When I'm disobedient, when I step outside the will of God, his truth carries on. See, he endures. And so it would behoove us to follow him in gladness because the truth of who he is and what he's done it endures he can't do anything but be victorious so let's put it in a physical term you've got some leader who has never failed <laughs> that's impossible but you know we're imagining a leader that has never failed. You followed them several years. And they've never failed. Everything they've ever entered into, they've come out smelling like roses. And then all of a sudden, this leader asks you to go into some rough terrain. And you give up and you quit. And then you get mad that you can't find victory. And you know where that leader is? That leader's over there in victory because they endured through the rough terrain. So I'm telling you here with the Lord, he is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures. So even when the road gets rocky, when the hills get steep, when the water seems deep, when the fire is hot, he is good, he is everlasting and he endures. And so the thing is, is you don't have to be. You have to surrender and be in him. And if you're in him and he is in you, he will make sure that you endure. He will cause you to become good. And then we have the promise of everlasting, eternal life. But it's not who I am, it is who he is. Worship is important. Worship team, y'all go ahead and come back. This is a one-point message with a very lengthy introduction. My preach got turned on. I will we got a baptism this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about it too. And we got three or four more in the works. Worship is important. Singing is a powerful way to worship. It's not the only way to worship. It's just a powerful way to worship. Because when we sing, when we partake in music, it allows us to express the goodness of God with passion. It allows us to get our emotions involved and to release our experience of how faithful and good he is. And so to come into his courts with praise, to sing unto the Lord, to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, do, do we understand that if we would just lift our voice in praise to him. That is a song unto the Lord. It doesn't have to have a tempo, a melody. It doesn't have to have a chord progression. Just if we lift our voice. And there's importance to this. 
Yes, the Lord knows your heart and he knows your mind. But there's something about it when it comes out of your mouth. The Word of God tells us that life and death is in the tongue. The Word of God tells us that faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. You can't hear your mind. <laughs> you might know what your mind is thinking, but your ears can't hear your mind. Let me tell you something else. The devil can't read your mind. Oh, he'll interject some things in your mind to try to get you off course. That's the reason you got to take your thoughts captive because he'll interject some things in there, but he can't read your mind. And so if you began declaring the word of God out of your mouth, not only is your ear hearing the word of God, which is creating faith within you, the currency of heaven being faith, every devil in hell that's been listening into your conversations began to hear praises unto the name that has been exalted above them. The name at which they will have to bow. The name at which they will declare is Lord. <laughs> we were having a conversation last night. You know, Jim, you kept saying, you know, you can name drop, you can name drop. Well, when you open up your mouth in praise, you name drop in Jesus all up in the middle of everything the devil's trying to do. And I've had a lot of thoughts before. But then when I finally opened my mouth and say it, it's like it becomes reality. The Lord in prayer, now's the time. Speaking of radio and media. That was in my heart. That was in my mind. My spirit. Now's the time. I ponder on it for a few hours. And then finally, it come out of my mouth. Mary, I believe the Lord is telling me that now's the time. I don't know exactly what, where, or when, but I'm, I'm going to research this thing. It's, it's happening. And when it come out of my mouth, it settled way down deep in my spirit. Like now, this has gone from a thought to it is reality. It's reality. How many times have we been short on funding? How many times has our children or loved ones been sick? And we're heartbroken over it. But then we open our mouth and we say, Lord, I thank you that you are still the God who heals. I thank you, Lord, that you have said it's by the stripes that you bear that healing belongs to us. And God, right now... I, they are sick and they don't seem to be getting any better but I'm just going to stop and praise you because I know you're able because you said so and instantly your whole countenance changes because it's gone from this worry and this attack of the mind of doom and gloom to faith has been released through a heart of thanksgiving that says, God, even though I don't understand, even though I don't like it, you are still worthy to be praised and your word is still true and I'm just going to magnify you for a minute. I have found one of the most effective prayers is thanking God for what I don't have. I'll say that again. One of the most effective prayers I have found is thanking Him for what I don't have. What do you mean? Well, if I'm needing healing and I don't feel healed, I still thank Him for my healing. When the headache won't go away and you've taken every medicine that you don't want to take and it's still there. You've drank, in ca you've drank caffeine, you've drank water, you've ate something. It's still there. Battle it for three or four days. This is what I do. And then finally the Lord will say, yo dummy, won't you just thank me? <laughs> and I say, Lord, thank you. 
thank you for removing this migraine. Lord, I, I, I can't hardly open my eyes right now in this light, sitting in a dark room with a pillow over my head. But I thank you that this thing is gone in Jesus' name. And I'm going to venture to say 99% of the time when I take that pillow off of my head, the lights no longer hurt. Battle it for three or four days and I don't receive it until I thank him for it. How many things in life are we robbing ourselves from because we do not have a heart of thanksgiving? Amen. This evening, I want to continue uh, the teaching slash, slash preaching from this morning entitled A Heart of Thanksgiving. So this is A Heart of Thanksgiving Part 2, if you will. Uh, we're going to pick up in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, I rearranged the formation of the message a little bit, wanting to look at some deeper details. Now that it's a two-part message, I can talk about some details that I wasn't going to talk about this morning for the sake of time, but I obviously misjudged the timing of this sermon like never before. Uh, <laughs> I really thought I had about a 45-minute sermon, and uh, I had a 45-minute introduction. And so anyhow, <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, but if you will, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, let the peace of God to which also you are called in one body, rule in your heart. And I love this. That's the end of that sentence. But then immediately, and be thankful. And so, again, I want to walk through this passage similar to what I did with Psalms 100 this morning. But let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That is the thought there. The to which also you are called in one body is a parenthetical. It is set off by commas, if you will. It's a, it's a pause and let me say this before I finish my thought statement. But let the peace of God rule in your hearts. When you allow something to rule anything, it has control. It has say-so. And so as we talked about this morning, having a heart of thanksgiving leads to the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord leads to the peace of God. And the peace of God is what marches us into the victory of God. Because when we receive that peace that passes all understanding, it really doesn't matter how bad the circumstances are. The peace of God carries us through them. That assurance that God is going to see me through. Well, it all starts with having this heart of thanksgiving. And so the idea here to let the peace of God rule your heart. I've shared with you several times, I've made little statements, and I had this real big message about halfway done dealing with mental health. And I thought to myself and in some prayer, and I just never had peace to really deliver it in its entirety. Quite frankly, I think it's too heavy to be delivered in one setting. And so the Lord has just been giving me nuggets of it to drop into every message. And so over the course of 20 messages, we'll get little nuggets of some things that the Lord is dealing with mental health. And so if the peace of God is ruling in our hearts, then I am constantly focusing on who he is and what he has done. And, and, and I, I want to say this before I go any further. If you battle anxieties, I am not condemning you. I am not passing judgment on you. But I am going to declare the word of the Lord this evening that anxiety does not come from God. It is a ploy of the enemy. Anxiety is the way that the enemy steals the peace of God from you. It is the opposite 
opposition to the peace of God. And so if the peace of God is ruling, the peace of God has control of my heart, then the anxiety of the enemy, the opposition to that peace can't stay there as well. Because what communion does darkness and light have? So am I telling you that you should never have anxiety? That you No, you're going to feel anxious from time to time. There's going to be situations and circumstances that seem heavy and weigh on you. Yes, they are. But what you do with them, quite frankly, is your responsibility. Do you allow that anxiety to begin to rule your heart and mind? And then when that anxiety is ruling your heart and mind, then the peace of God is stolen, and then you become bound in fear and doubt to whatever the situation and circumstance is. Or do you say, no, I don't like this situation. I don't understand this situation. I'm not exactly sure even what the solution is. But what I do know is that my God is faithful and he will see me. And I began to declare the truth of who he is. And when I began to declare his truth, I talked about this a little bit this morning. As I declare that truth, faith in me builds up. And as the faith within me builds up, as the word of God goes forth, it does what it was set forth to do. Therefore, his peace now is able to enter in. Philippians 4, we'll get there here in a little bit, but it says that the peace of God guards our heart and mind. So why is it that you have to have the peace of God to rule in your heart? Because the peace of God is the very thing that will guard your heart against the schemes of the enemy. So how is it that you come out of depression? How is it that you come out of anxiety? How is it that you don't allow the weight and the worries of this world to squish you? You remind yourself with the word of God who your God is. You begin to thank him for his faithfulness. You have a heart of thanksgiving. And as you thank him, his joy enters in. As his joy enters in, his peace enters in. And when his peace is present, you have victory because your heart is now guarded By what? The peace of God. And how did the peace of God get there? The joy. And how did the joy get there? Thanksgiving. So what do we got to have? A heart of thanksgiving. Say, well, you just keep talking in a circle, saying the same thing. Well, it is a cycle. It is a cycle. It is a never-ending, ongoing cycle. Every day, his mercies are new. A clock works in a cycle. It just keeps going around and around and around. And so if the mercies of God are ever mercy, the mercies of God are new every morning, the grace of God is sufficient, then I'm just going to keep thanking him, inviting the joy in, receiving the peace, walking in victory, thanking the Lord, being in joy, having peace, walking in victory, thanking the Lord over it's not a oh, well I have arrived, I'm done. <laughs> you have to continue to allow the peace of God to rule and in your heart and be thankful. And be thankful. In this peace of God, we are called into one body. And so in the peace of God, he knits us to him and he is in us. And then we are knitted together. When you're walking in the peace of God, you won't also be walking in the spirit of offense. I'm going to say that again. When you're walking in the peace of God, you won't also be walking in the spirit of offense. When you're walking in the peace of God, people might do you wrong. People may be doing wrong. People might not have it right. But you're in the peace of God, and you got the peace of God. And so you really ain't too concerned with how they doing because you know you where you're supposed to be. And you just pray for them. Because when I got the peace of God, I'm not competing with you. When I got the peace of God, if you do good, praise God. If you do bad, well, I hate it for you. (laughs) But I got the peace of God. I'm going to keep on keeping on. 
what will eat most people's lunch is when you can walk in the peace of God and they're being tormented over something that they don't even, you don't even know you did to them. Because they walk in unforgiveness holding a grudge from 30 years ago and you're just walking in the peace of God and it's eating their lunch because you're at peace. Well, they're not the one who's in sin. It's you who's got the unforgiveness. I've heard it taught my whole life and dealing with different things and on what the unpardonable sin is. What's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? There's but one thing in the Word of God that says it will cause you from receiving the forgiveness of God, and that is unforgiveness. So I believe that unforgiveness is the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit because you are denying people the right to receive the forgiveness of God. You are denying that the blood of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit is insufficient, and so you hold on to something that God's already let go of. I don't have no commentary on that. That's the Holy Ghost revelation to me. I believe that that's what blaspheming of the Holy Spirit is, is unforgiveness. I believe unforgiveness is the unpardonable sin because it is the only thing in the Word of God that says, if you don't forgive them, I can't forgive you. If the peace of God is ruling in my heart, see, if I got unforgiveness in my heart, I ain't going to have peace in my heart because the Lord is going to be convicting me to forgive. He is going to instruct me to become the peacemaker. He's going to instruct me to walk in unity and extend grace and mercy, to extend compassion. And as long as there's things that's not right in my heart, then the Spirit of God is correcting me. And I don't know about you, but I don't have peace and correction. <laughs> I don't feel good about it. When I can truly take a deep breath in and say, it is well with my soul is when I know that I have been in the presence of God and he has revealed to me any hidden place and I have laid it before him and put it under the blood of Jesus and I can say I don't know and I don't quite understand but what I do know is it is well with my soul because my God is able. That's what happens when the peace of God begins to rule your life. And it starts with a heart of thanksgiving. Let the word of Christ, here goes back to that word, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. I just, mm, just let the word of Christ. What does Jesus say about me? What does Jesus say about himself? What does Jesus say about this situation? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ be the source of your wisdom. Teach according to the word of Christ. Admonish according to the word of Christ. Build one another up. I love this. With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing in grace. When was the last time? And I know this kind of sounds, you know, kind of... Uh, mushy. When was the last time we sang over one another? When we just declared the goodness of God over each other. When we declared the faithfulness of God over. That's what this is. Admonishing one another. So building one another up with what? With psalms. What are psalms? Well, you know what psalms are. We've got a whole book of them. And that's the psalms this is talking about. When do we just read the psalms over one another? Come to one another and say, you listen here. You better make a joyful... Uh, 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 no, 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 no. You make a joyful noise unto the Lord. For He is good. And His mercy endures forever. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Listen, His truth endures to every generation. I know your kids aren't acting right right now. But I'm telling you, you've got a promise in the Word of God that if you've done the Word of God and you have taught them according to His Word, that they will, they will not depart from it when they're old. That didn't say anything about being some headache moments. <laughs> I think that's the reason the Word says it, because God knew. You're going to have some of them that's just a little hard-headed. they got to sow their wild oats. they got to do their thing. But as, as a parent, you've prayed over them, and you've kept the faith. Just hold on to that. Admonish one another with the songs and with hymns. 
Of course, the hymns that he's writing up here were the hymns that they were just coming up with there in the first century, that they were just creating songs of adoration unto Christ as Lord and Savior. Build each other up, singing psalms, hymns. Uh, admonish one another in psalms and hymns. Here's something in spiritual song. When is it that we've just worshiped the Lord in spirit? Just allowed our prayer language to just flow. Just to worship him. Just took off all chains and just said, here I am raw before you, Lord. Just to worship you. Spiritual songs and singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Also, I'm going to do a little teaching here. He says to sing with psalms. Psalms is a word that the English come up with in translating the Septuagint, which was the Latin translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Psalms is not a Hebrew word, but the Hebrew root of this is songs sung with stringed instruments. And so if in the New Testament we're told to sing psalms, the Hebrew root of that word is to sing songs with stringed instruments. So the idea that it's sin to sing a song with an instrument unto the Lord is foolishness if you don't understand the actual original language that the Word of God was spoken in. Psalms 150 makes it clear to play every instrument that there is to play and to give praise unto the Lord. Everything. That's what the piano is. It's the harp. It does say timbrel. We're going to play with it because that's a cymbal. I know it says high sounding cymbal, but the timbrels and other cymbals. That's going to be our, you know, out of context translation to keep the tambourines at the church. And dance. It's okay to dance before the Lord. It's okay to get excited about the king. See, when the peace of God is ruling in your heart... When you have a heart of thanksgiving and the word of Christ is richly dwelling within you, then as I said earlier this morning, your soul will sing. When you're in the peace of God, when you have the peace of God, when your heart and your mind is guarded with the peace of God, your soul will sing. Sing to one another and sing unto the Lord with the grace in our hearts. Verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks, giving thanks, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Who's Him? Jesus. We ought to give thanks unto the Father through Christ Jesus. Thanks for what? Thanks for the finished work. Thanks for who He is. Thanks for making a way that we can be in right relationship with Him. I want to read to you out of the Fire Bible the commentary for verse 17. I was reading this a couple of days ago, and it was just good. And I thought about rewording it, but I said, why? Just read it to them. So the Fire Bible says, according, in dealing with verse 17, I'm going to read verse 17 once more. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The Fire Bible reads, The Bible presents general principles that help Holy Spirit-led believers determine the rightness or wrongness of activities and behaviors not specifically mentioned in God's Word. In everything that we say, do, think, or enjoy, we should be guided by asking ourselves the following questions. Number one, can it be done for God's glory and honor? Number two, can it be done in the name of the Lord Jesus? Number three, 
Can it be done while truly giving thanks to God? Number four, is it a Christ-like action? Would Jesus do it? Number five, could it cause another Christian to compromise his or her conscience and convictions and at some point weaken his or her devotion to Christ? Number six, will it strengthen or weaken my desire for spiritual things such as God's word and prayer? Number seven, could it weaken or hinder my influence for Christ on others who do not know him or who may look at me as an example of Christ-like behavior? I thought those were some pretty good questions. I'll talk to you this morning about serving. And that serving is putting someone before yourself. The question here, number five could it cause other Christians to compromise their conscience or conviction and at some point weaken his or her devotion to Christ? I thought, well, that's a question that we ought to be asking ourselves. Sometimes we get so hung up in the liberties that we have as individuals, but we do not talk, think, we do not take in thought what the believers around us may be influenced by in our action. What, if whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm saying, how is it affecting the people around me? Am I projecting a Christ-like mindset or attitude? Are people seeing me and seeing a Christ-like behavior that will build up their faith, that will encourage them to serve God? Are they seeing in me a hope and a peace and a joy that's going to encourage them to keep on when things get tough? Or do they see me suffer and give up and get frustrated just like every unlost person in the world? I thought you had the God of peace that was ruling in your heart and life. Yet you have more anxiety and issues than I have. I don't mean that hard. But I really think it's time that we start asking ourselves some hard questions as believers. In dealing with having a heart of thanksgiving, again, I'm not trying to beat you up or get too heavy. I'm going to get on to some good stuff here in a minute. But if we are truly pausing in the moment of chaos and giving thanks unto the Lord, our heart is going to be right. And so when you start dealing with so-called believers who have a wrong attitude and a wrong heart about most everything, there's a problem. Because the peace of God is not going to rule a heart and also allow it to be in disobedience and deception. So well, how do I make the peace of God rule my heart? You better start thanking him. Tell you like I told Sister Melinda that I shared about this morning. You just start thanking him for the shoes on your feet. Just thank him because he's worthy. I want us to also look in Ephesians chapter 5. I want to show you in four different epistles today or letters the similarities of the word of God and some of the root of the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5 starting in verse 15, reading through verse 21. See then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise men, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit." Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual song, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, being submissive to one another in the fear of God. So here, and, and I, I don't want to get too far gone here, but to walk carefully and to not be fools, but be wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Then 17 says again, do not be unwise, 
but understand what the will of the Lord is. I was praying on that thought to not be unwise, but to know what the will of the Lord is. And in my praying on this, I just felt this drop in my spirit. If you don't know what the will of God is in a particular situation, then don't move. When you start moving before you know the will of God, you are moving foolishly. Be wise and know what the will of the Lord is. I mean, it actually says, don't be unwise. Understand the will of the Lord. Know the will of the Lord. And so when you don't know what the will of the Lord is, you are in a position of being unwise. And then the verse right before it says, hey, don't be unwise. <laughs> so make sure that you are praying. And spending time in the presence of God. And do not make a move until you know the will of the Lord. Well, I feel God nudging me in a direction. Okay, cool. A nudge in the will of God is not the same thing. Get the mind of Christ about the situation. And then move on it. Well, how do I get the mind of Christ on a situation? You pray. And you read his word. Well, how much do I pray? You pray until you get the mind of Christ. Until the word of Christ dwells richly in you. Until you know that you know that you know. I want to use myself as an example on something. I have been told that, you know, well, you're just arrogant. I've been told that several times. But you just think you've got it figured out. You're just arrogant. You walk in here thinking you've got the whole plan. You're just arrogant. And I don't mean this arrogantly. But I do have the whole plan when I walked in here. Because if I hadn't spent time in prayer and having the mind of God, I wouldn't have walked in here. And so when I walked in the room and I had a plan, I, yeah, I sure did walk in here with the confidence of that this is the plan because I've prayed until I had the mind of God and now I have the word of Christ dwelling richly in me and I'm here to stand on the promise and the sure foundation of his word and ain't nobody going to change my mind. Well, that's just being hard-headed. No, that's having the mind of Christ. Hard-headedness is just to walk in the room and think you know what you're doing. Actually, that's stupidity. <laughs> but to get on your face before the Lord... I've driven Allie crazy time and time again on different situations. And she, would you just make up your mind? Well, I can't because I don't have the mind of God yet. So I talk about it every day. I'm sick of hearing this. I wish you'd make a choice. Well, I'm going to talk about it every day in the privacy of my home until I get the mind of God. And until then, I'm just going to talk about it until I hear the mind of God. I'm going to pray on it until I hear the mind of God. I'm going to stew on it until I get the mind of God. And then finally, one day, when I get the mind of God, then I'll make a choice. Well, I think that's the wrong choice. I don't care. I finally got the mind of God. This is what we're doing. You can have that same confidence because it's not a confidence in self. It's a confidence in him. I have spent time in the presence of the Lord until I have received the mind of Christ. And now that I have the mind of Christ, we're going to possess the land. But what it? Carry on. What does this have to do with the heart of thanksgiving? The heart of thanksgiving is what's going to get you in the presence of the Lord to hear the voice of God to get the mind of Christ. The, the, the quickest way to get in the presence of God is to begin to thank Him for something. Because a thanksgiving unto the Lord is a praise unto the Lord. And He says He inhabits the praise of His people. Heart of thanksgiving. But therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. It blows my mind that we have, even within our own fellowship, 
a group of preachers that's trying to get it approved at our general council year after year after year. It keeps failing, praise the Lord. But year after year after year, or I say year after year, they have general council every two years. They try to get it approved and ratified where preachers can drink wine. Even though the Word of God says for the bishop to be far removed from strong drink, never mind the fact that the scripture right here, yes, it says, well, it just says to be not drunk. Well, you tell me when drunk starts and stops. How are you going to find out? The only way to find out your limit is to exceed it, which means you've entered into drunkenness, which means you had to become disobedient to figure out how far you could stretch. That's the reason the Word of God says you are being reckless in your living. So I'm dealing with preachers here. So see, I'm preaching to myself. Some of y'all can say, Ooh, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I ain't a preacher right now. Because the Bible also says that a preacher mixed up in reckless living isn't fit to stand behind the pulpit. So if you're a preacher trying to figure out how much you can drink, get out from behind the pulpit, you're not called, you're a fraud. That's what the Bible says. Be not drunk with wine, it's reckless living. Rather, be filled with the Spirit. So you want to be filled up with something? That makes you feel good? You want something to fill you to the overflow that's going to eradicate the worries of this world? Then you get full of the Holy Ghost and you allow the peace of God to rule in your heart. You allow the peace of God to guard your heart and mind. And then the cares of this world is washed away. But it's not with alcohol in a bottle. It's with the presence of God dwelling within. I was sharing with Sister Jill this afternoon, coming back from lunch, that I was in this vein of preachers at one point in time. And I do believe they love the Lord, but they just got off course. But they got real big on this one saying, and I just, it never settled well in my spirit. It says, oh, well, You've got the spirit of entrepreneurship. You've got the spirit of a writer. You've got the spirit of this. And you've got the spirit of that. And I finally had to tell them, I said, you need to change your language because it bothers me. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, if you want to say you have an anointing for writing, you have a gifting for writing, you have a gifting for singing, I'm, I'm good with that. But when you tell me I got a spirit of something... The only spirit of anything I want is the spirit of the Lord. I don't want no other spirit in me, whether it makes me money or don't. Uh, I want the Holy Ghost and that's it. Any other spirit shows up, it's not a God. Doesn't matter how many crosses you dangle on it and how much positive and encouraging scripture you wrap around it. You better not receive not an Aaron spirit other than the Holy Spirit. We got to be mindful. Say, where did all this come from? This all deals with knowing the mind of God. This all deals with when you spend time. Most of these that I just spoke of, they get off track in money, the greed gospel. I like making money. Raise your hand in here. If you like making money. Who has had plenty and who has had lack and liked plenty better? Huh? Yeah, every one of us. I ain't nobody in here says, you know what, I like being flat broke. I'm just going to stay that way. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I've been flat broke so long, I don't know what plenty, no. But <laughs> no, but, no, I understand feeling like we need more and it would be nice to have more. But when we began to prostitute the gospel in the name of a prophet... I ain't talking about the spirit of prophecy. I'm talking about prophet, ching, ching. Because they aren't a prophet. They're in it for the prophet. I hadn't figured out that ministry yet. I ain't never made no money. But it all boiled back to a lack that they had. And the anxiety and the worry of the lack that they had caused them to pervert their gospel to become about money. And then they begin to relegate that the blessing of the Lord comes in the view of things rather than if in the midst of their lack, 
in the midst of their anxiety, in the midst of their worry, if they would have begun to have a heart of thanksgiving and allowed the peace of God to minister to them, allowed the word of God to make known the will of God, to get the mind of Christ and allow their hearts and minds to be guarded with the peace of God, they would have realized, yeah, I'm broke and I ain't got no money, but God is faithful and it's going to be okay. And their gospel would have stayed pure. Their ministry would have stayed pure. But it got off course because in a time of need, they focused on the need rather than having a heart of thanksgiving. So you said something earlier about mental health. That is what I have learned in the scripture is the key to mental health. A heart of thanksgiving. Sister Mary was telling me, I was looking in the scripture. She saw something on a secular setting. But says that scientifically, the endorphins in your body, anxiety and fear, it causes your heart rate to go up and you get anxious. But when you began to have an attitude of gratitude, was this language, that it soothes your heart rate and it slows your breathing because the endorphins in your body that are released while you're processing positive thoughts of thankfulness brings peace and calm to you where fear and anxiety gets you all worked up and uncertain and confused. Oh, well, that's what science says. Well, now let's think of what the Word of God says. The peace of God will do what? Guard your heart and your mind. Now, what did I just say that one of the results of anxiety is? It's frustration, irritation, confusion. Who is the author of confusion? So what is the answer to mental health? A heart of thanksgiving. I'm going to show you here briefly. I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> but there's not going to be a part three. There's just going to be a long night. Let me just show you this. Verse 20. Give thanks always for all things. So how much do we need to give God thanks for? All things. How often should we give him thanks for all things? Always. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses, I'm going to read you, I was going to just read you 16 through 18, but I'm going to read you verses 12 through 24. I'm just going to read them to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to acknowledge those who labor among you, who are appointed over you in the Lord and instruct you, esteem them very highly in the love for their works' sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Now, we exhort you, brothers, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Support the weak and be patient toward everyone. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. But always seek to, go seek to do good to one another and to all. Verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Examine all things firmly holding on to what is good. Abstain from all appearances of evil. May the very God of peace sanctify you completely. And I pray to God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. I love verse 24. He who calls you is faithful, and he'll do it. <laughs> Glory, and he'll do it. So the things he's calling you to, he'll do it. <clears throat> Hear that. The things he is calling you to, 
He will do it. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? You ain't. <laughs> You're going to just begin to thank him for his faithfulness. And then he's going to do it through you and give you the credit. For, boy, you talking about a loving God. <laughs> he's going to stand up and say, good, well done, good and faithful servant. Even though you didn't do anything, I did it all through you. <laughs> but well done. Faithful is he who calls you. And he'll do it. Hold on, I've got to tie some things together here. I'm getting excited. Verse 18. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Hold on. But then in Ephesians, verse 5, I mean chapter 5, in, 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 in verse, uh, ra -da 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 -da, is it 17? Pull up verse 17 for me. Ephesians 5, 17. So I don't have to flip back over there. Yeah. Therefore... Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What's the will of the Lord? Well, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. So what's the will of God? To give thanks. What's the key to mental health? What's the key to figuring out the shortage of the lack and the issues and the circumstances in this world? What's the key? A heart of thanksgiving. When I just give thanks, just thank Him. Just give Him glory, give Him praise, worship Him. Glory. Philippians 4, verses 4. I'm going to read through 7, I think. We might read a little further. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let everyone come to know your gentleness. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanks giving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will protect your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, things are pure, lovely, things that are of good report. If there is any virtue, if there is any praise, think on these things. What's the key to it, preacher? A heart of thanksgiving. Are you seeing it? Are the dots connecting? The phrase to be thankful or with thanksgiving is found in all four epistles. All four letters, the letters to the church of Colossae, Ephesus, Thessalonica, and Philippi, all of them, they were all written relatively close. Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians are prison epistles. They were all written around 62, 63 A.D. First and second Thessalonians was written about a decade prior. It was written 51, 52. I think they, they think the first letter was 51 A.D. The second letter was 52 A.D. Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians to deal with God's purpose for Christ, followers, and the purpose of the church. That was the theme of the letter to the Ephesians. So in dealing with what your purpose is, he says, be thankful. He wrote a letter to the Philippians talking to them about ultimate joy in living for Christ. Yet in talking about ultimate joy in living for Christ, he says, be thankful. Then he writes a letter to the church at Colossae dealing with Christ is supreme and Christ is sufficient. Yet dealing with the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ, he says, be thankful. And a decade before that, 
writing to the church at Thessalonica, telling them that you have to have righteous living and Jesus is returning, he says, be thankful. So you want to know the purpose of God for the church? Well, you ain't going to find it without being thankful. You want to know what ultimate joy is in living for Christ? It's found in thankfulness. Do you want to know how to enjoy the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. What do you mean? I want, you to, talk, I want to talk about that for just a second. How is it that the sufficiency of Christ is tied to my heart of thanksgiving? Because without a heart of thanksgiving, you can't have the joy. And without the joy, you can't have the peace. And without the peace, your heart and mind is not guarded. And if your heart and mind is not guarded, then Christ is limited in what he can do in you. Because if your heart is not ruled with peace and thanksgiving, it's probably ruled in unforgiveness and bitterness, which is the only thing that limits the forgiveness of God. And if the forgiveness of God is limited, then the sufficiency of Christ is hindered. The supremacy of Christ is hindered. How is it hindered? Well, because if the peace of God is not ruling in your heart, then the opposite is. Anxiety, fear, doubt, frustration, confusion. Well, if those things are ruling your heart, then Christ isn't. If Christ isn't ruling your heart, then he's not supreme in your situation. Righteous living and the return of Christ. <laughs> thanksgiving. Well, how do I live righteously through thanksgiving? Your heart and mind is guarded. He's going to lead you in the paths of righteousness. Let me close here. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms 95. I were opened this morning with it. Psalms 95. I want to just read you the first six verses. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The height of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. In the four letters that I have taught from, today in the New Testament, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1 Thessalonians. To be thankful is found in all four. Peace is found in Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philippians. Rejoice is found in 1 Thessalonians and Philippians. To sing or to speak psalms and hymns is found in Ephesians and Colossians. Psalms 95, verses 1 through 6 that I've read for you, both deal with joy and thanksgiving. And it was written somewhere between 500 and 1,000 years before Christ. So if the answer to entering into his presence 1,000 years before Christ comes to earth is joy and thanksgiving, and 30-something years after his death, and the Apostle Paul is writing letters to the church, and he's telling them how to live righteously. He's talking to them about the supremacy of Christ. He's talking to them about the joy of Christ. He's talking to them about the return of Christ. He's talking to them about their purpose as the church. And what does he bring up? To be joyful. To be at peace. But in every one of them, thanks. Giving. A heart of thanksgiving. And so I pray that from this morning to this evening, some things have been broken off. 
I believe that if we can get our hearts and minds wrapped around having a heart of thanksgiving, that we can open wide the path for Christ to walk into our situation and the peace of God to guard our hearts and minds against the schemes of the enemy. Amen. Thank you so much again for taking time to listen to a message from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. We do this through the help of our listeners and friends in the community. If you would like to donate to our broadcast, you can go to cornerstoneatlanta.tv and give as the Lord would lead you. But again, I, Pastor Richard Wade of Cornerstone Assemblies of God, just say thank you for taking time, and I pray the Lord make this real to you today.